Hello, everyone. I'm Ernie Humphrey, the CEO and COO of Treasury Webinars. I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar today, the Bank Relationship Management Triad Bank Fees, Ray Rock, and Collaboration. I'm honored and humbled to have two co-speakers with me today, and I'm sure everyone's happy um, that we don't have to listen to Ernie for the whole hour today. So uh, really, uh, this has always been near and dear to my heart, bank relationship management. I used to work um, at AFP. I managed the bank relationship management suite. I also had the opportunity to manage uh, AFP service codes. Uh, and then I've, I've been following Dan and Stefan, and I'm fans of theirs. And I saw Stefan do a great presentation uh, on Ray Rock. Uh, and really the value of that. And when I was in corporate treasury, we had struggles in communicating uh, with our bank, right? Um, our company model, so they valued our risk too high. And then uh, other than myself, uh, you know, there's few people that know more than me about the service codes and Dan knows way more than me and so, do his, so does his colleague Bridget Myers. So before we get in, um, I'd like to welcome to the webinar, uh, Dan Gill is the Global Head of Business and Development and Compliance at Redbridge Debt and Treasury Advisory. Uh, Dan, welcome to the webinar and give us just a little snippet of your impressive background. Sure, thanks Ernie. Uh, again, my name is Dan Gill. Uh, I've spent the last 24 years in Treasury doing nothing but helping large corporates with their bank relationships, bank fees, bank account management, uh, et cetera. Um, I joined Redbridge about five years ago when we started our software arm, and I'm excited to talk about my favorite topic in Treasury today. All right. Um, thanks, Dan. Uh, also honored to have with me, um, Stefan Ireland, Country Head Managing Director for Redbridge. Uh, Stefan, why don't you give us a little bit about your background and welcome, my friend. Sure. Thank you, Ernie. Yes. So, um, sorry for the French accent, but you're going to have to deal with this the entire webinar. Uh, I come from France. I was uh, started in investment banking uh, back in the time, a French bank, French bank called Credit Agricole CIB. I spent a little bit less than 10 years in the banking industry that I loved, but I joined Redbridge 17 years ago, uh, various positions uh, on every aspect, that advisory now managing the US operations for the past five to six years. I love Rayrock, I love banking relationship. I'll be delighted to go through a little bit of a concept. Uh, let's be ready for it. All right, um, thanks Stefan. So a little bit um, about our agenda today, our roadmap today. Um, I'm, I'm gonna drive us through pretty quickly on my slides because I wanna give my co-speakers uh, enough time to cover their topics a little bit more in depth and everybody hears me talk. And so uh, if you would like a copy of the slides, please send an email to Ernie at treasurywebinars.com. Uh, if you'd like to ask me any questions regarding CTP credit, please send an email to Ernie at treasurywebinars.com. So please let me know if you have any questions or would like a copy of the presentation. Again, I'm gonna drive through uh, fairly quickly here. Um, so dimensions of bank relationship management, current and emerging trends, right? Um, and, and then I'll pass the floor um, over to Dan on uh, the role of technology in bank relationship management. And we'll, and we'll really spend some time there uh, with Dan um, on many things, but about um, our favorite topic, um, trying to understand the bank fees and what banks are charging us and why. Uh, and then Stefan will really dive into the role of Ray Rock. Um, and this is this was incredibly insightful to me, and I, I give him kudos. I'm I don't like to sit through presentations anymore, but he gave a, a very fascinating presentation. Then we'll wrap things up with some key takeaways. We'll we'll take questions if we have time. If not, fear not. Um, you can go ahead, um, you know, and hit us up, and we will follow up with you after the webinar. So I know you're all excited um, for your first polling question. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that for you. So uh, the first polling question is asking you to share with us. Um, is bank relationship management a top priority of the Treasury Department um, at my company? And for me, um, in surveys, I really have found um, that, that we never self-identify that it is. And some people tell me, well, I just really don't even need to say it. So, so you know, so I just want to get everyone's take. And don't worry, I'm not going to tell on you um, if you say no or not even close. Uh, I appreciate everyone's consideration in taking our polling question to you today. Uh, those of you interested in receiving CTP credits, you'll have to answer all of our polling questions uh, here today. So let me go ahead and up just for a few more seconds. We got a very good response rate already, um, 85%. Even if you don't want CTP credit, please um, push the button. Um, we appreciate your consideration. So let me go ahead and give you a little warning. Five, four, I'm still in NCA basketball mode. Three, two, one. All right. Now let's go ahead and take a quick peek. Um, 
So we have um, 3%, not even close, 13% disagree. So uh, so to me, um, neither agree or disagree. And so uh, we'll really get into this and uh, I'm not gonna get on my soapbox uh, too much, um, but I think um, it should be a top priority, especially uh, in today's world and especially how important and the real advances uh, in technology. So thank you so much, everyone. I just think it's interesting to see uh, you know where people are and so it's going to be great uh, for my uh, fellow co-speakers we're all going to inspire you to make it a top priority and those of you who already have it as a top priority uh, uh, good for you and hopefully you'll share best practices uh, with me offline so um, dimensions of bank relationship I always used to say you treat it like a marriage and you you really want to look at all the dimensions of it so obviously we have the credit you want to look at the capabilities and technology the relationship itself which really overarches everything the customer service the price and the communication again i'm going to be uh, driving through these slides a little bit fast and furious um, and so i just wanted to share a little benchmarking ask, ask, ask access to capital and liquidity um, i've been honored to be involved in the treasury coalition um, they have been driving a survey that's been going on to take the temperature uh, of treasury professionals ever since uh, COVID really started to take hold so the survey they've been doing uh, they switch a frequency from weekly to monthly. Now it's bi-monthly. So just some really interesting uh, metrics there. And so I invite you to go to treasurycoalition.com. There's a lot of uh, to unpack on this slide, but I just wanted to show you the type of information that you can have access to. And it's really interesting. So you look at access to adequate liquidity. So right out of the gate, what we saw, people weren't, uh, you know, COVID, whatever. But then we started to see right it go down and then it became first top priority so then we've had these little spikes when we all thought COVID was going away and then we all realized that that we're not there yet we're getting there with the vaccine and so just some interesting dynamics for you to to whet your appetite with research i know i'm kind of a nerd but don't worry dan uh, i'm not going to go through this slide for 20 minutes so this is another thing which you really want to have time to dig into um, and Craig Jeffrey does a great job. I'm happy to share the report with you. But it really takes a look at, at all the dimensions of capital and liquidity and just really shows the dynamics, right? And so it's just interesting to see, uh, take, take a few minutes and think about your company and just do some benchmarking. So I just wanted to kind of uh, give you guys a flavor for that. So um, treasurycoalition.com, just some great research. And it also helps you uh, go going forward, right? See that you're doing the right things. Oh, and now you're like, how many polling questions is this guy gonna have? All right, so let's go ahead and before we dive in to BRM, um, please share with me, how would you characterize your company's uh, bank relationship? What's the current status? Would you say, ah, poor, not good, acceptable, but getting better, good, or ideal? Again, I appreciate everyone's consideration in taking all of my polling questions and taking a minute to push that button. Those of you interested in receiving CTP credits, you'll have to answer all the polling questions. Don't worry, I'm not going to interrupt uh, Dan, Dana, Dan or Stefan with any polling questions. So I'm going to let them uh, really dive in. So I'm going to leave the polling question up, um, give you guys another uh, four or five seconds. Then we'll just take uh, a quick peek, right? Where you stand depends on where you sit, right? So let's go ahead and I'll give you th five, four, three, two, one. All right, let's take a quick a quick peek, peek here and I'm happy to share this results with you after the webinar as well. Um, looks like uh, acceptable but getting better. Okay so we got 70% of you good or ideal and so 30% of us everybody I'm, I don't know some of us might think we can never get ideal but really what you want to do is, is set your expectations and so for me if my expectation I'm a situation part of that is the community I'm hoping that you have all time to spend more time uh, with your banks and reach out uh, and, and just uh, touch base. So just a little bit um, about the relationship. I mean, some of these things um, seem like common sense, but these are things as a former treasury practitioner uh, that you should expect. Uh, uh, where will your bank be during the next crisis? Where were they um, during COVID? Do they really know about your company? Are they invested in you? Uh, uh, and your team, and then and and then from your side, right? We have to be good customers. And my old bankers are like, man, I wish you were like this when I worked with you. But what do you really know about the bank? Do you empower your bank to understand, anticipate, and meet your expectations? And also, banks aren't perfect, as we are not either. So, will you support 
right? The bank when they make mistakes. And so hopefully the banks that you are engaged with treat you as a relationship and not transactional, but you have to do the same. Uh, I call it honesty, authenticity, and being upfront. So if my bank said, okay, I made an error, I don't want excuses, how are we gonna fix it? Let's move on. Way back in the day, um, when it was just Wachovia, we had some issues, but they, I had a gentleman who was really upfront and, and, uh, and we really worked through some issues that weren't easy, but we got to the other side and they were really my most, my most valued banking partner. And I'm still connected uh, with those folks today. Um, evaluating the relationship. Uh, back in the day when I was at AFP, we had a whole suite. Uh, on the bank scorecard and so just kind of wanted to give you some resources again I'm not going to uh, read through my slides but this might be good for you to take a look at if you're using a bank scorecard you might want to just take a look and think about these things right sometimes I give you resources just to make you think benchmark sometimes you got to go back into the weeds right so a scorecard can be an effective relationship management tool it also helps you set expectations right and you can share those with your banks but you can also ask your banks how about a customer report card how are we doing uh in order in order to uh support you um and so just just know that that's a tool there's use and best practices there's a lot of templates out there um just really quickly the overview those of you that might not be familiar with it i think these are still standard way back in 2007 or 2008 my colleague terence foster i think we went through the whole thing and redid the whole thing um, and it was like 30 pages and I would I would recommend that you kind of pare this down um, a little bit so for me it's customer service how's your relationship manager what's their technology look like uh, Dan will get into the account analysis um, how do you what, what do they look like on counterparty risk and then you can be service category specific but we all need to be looking um, at our bank wallet of course and so for me it wasn't always about going with the lowest cost it was also about the relationship to me, it was the customer service and if they were offering me credit. And so let me hit you with my last polling question for a while um, before we hit hit one up at the end. Uh, just curious, I'm always curious to see um, how many folks in the audience use the bank scorecard to evaluate the quality. Uh, maybe you're using them now, which is great. No, but you used to use them, right? Maybe you found they aren't useful to you. Um, no, you've never used them or you don't know. So those of you that say, I don't know, you know what I'm gonna say. Uh, you're going to have some homework, so go ahead. It's a good idea to find out. And, and I recommend that you use some sort of scorecard. Um, that's just my personal opinion. And from um, the people I've talked to in Treasury, probably thousands of Treasury leaders, I talk to people, whether they like it or not. I know Dan will share that with you later. But okay, I've got the polling question up. Let me give you <clears throat> another few seconds. All right, let's go five, four, three, two, one, let's go ahead and close that. Let's go ahead and share. And so um, for me from past webinars, it's a lot lower um, than what we've seen. So the good news um, is that hopefully we are gonna inspire folks on the webinar. Maybe you wanted to see what the value was. Um, no, you've ever used them. And so we have you know, at least 50% that have never used them. Again, at first blush, <clears throat> excuse me, they can look really cumbersome. So, so, you, so you might not need to pare those down. So sometimes it kind of scares you away. Happy to walk you through that as well. But thank you, thank you. It's really interesting to see um, those results. And so I may have to do a webinar on the uh, bank relationship uh, scorecard here. All right, so I got a lot of slides to drive through here, so be patient. Um, th these are just customer service, right? This is what I expect. 800 number, right? Do you have visibility? Do they have visibility into your entire relationship? Um, when I was in Treasury, there was a disconnect. The people in Treasury didn't know um, I had pension pension business with them. And so, uh, and then this is important to me. Um, every person on my team should be treated like me, right? So you shouldn't treat the Treasury specialist or the accounting person any different from your side. Uh, again, do you have a customer service team? Do you have direct access? And then really, how do they support you? Um, bank pricing, um, Dan will really dive into this, so I'm really gonna not, I touch on this just a little bit. Um, you know, you want to look at do you have negotiated price from each bank? How many accounts do you have? Right. I'll let Dan dive into this. How much are you earning on your bank balances? And so bank pricing is a dimension, but I'll leave that for the expert, which is Dan. Um, again, Dan will touch on this and much more. What's your structure? What's your transparency? Do you understand your account analysis statement? I confess I did not, even though I ran the AFP service codes. Um, so then we talk about the bank IQ. 
Um, this is really about tracking and monitoring and kind of man managing the metrics that make sense, right? Uh, just kind of some of the same things on your bank IQ. Um, and so you want, Dan will talk about this. You want to look at um, if banks are consistent. Um, do, you, do you communicate regularly with your banks? Do you look at variances month over month? Do you understand them? And then can you compare service services across banks? I did a survey and I was pleasantly surprised that a lot of people um, are benchmarking. And so I strongly urge you to do a service utilization review. Um, I've got some more detail there. Um, examine your services, create your summary, uh, create a mirror of your services. So take a look at what you're using why you're using it and make sure that you have that visibility there. Um, we have to be mindful of our communication with our banks, right? Um, we have in-person bank group meetings, which I think we should have quarterly, especially now we can do those visually. Um, individual bank, you have industry events, even though even they can be virtual. Um, AFP, I think, is going on in DC. So if you feel comfortable with COVID, you have to look at electronic too. What about your relationship management? What about your information reporting? What about your bank fee statement? So let's understand that we communicate with purpose. Uh, being a good customer, uh, this is important to me. Meet in person when possible. Stefan will talk about this. You should really um, endeavor to understand your bank's Rayrock model and make sure that, that, that they're assessing your risk um, correctly and understand what your value is to your bank, right? You want proactive communication, honest communication, and let's reset those expectations at least quarterly. So let's take a quick look at some bank relationship management trends. Uh, this is a preview. Um, I did a survey with High Radius. Um, we'll, we'll be doing a webinar on that later this month. Um, 278 respondents uh, across the country, um, various titles, industries, so demographics, uh, more on that later. Just interesting to see uh, number of bank relationships, of course, it matters, um, you know, the company demographics, but I was interested to see um, that that there were people had less bank accounts than when I back in the day. So we had 33%. Uh, and let me let me do touch on the fact that we had a very big percentage of the population that, that I would consider mid market or better really enterprise. Uh, this, this is probably most interesting for our purposes here today. Frequency of meetings with bank partners. I'm glad to see um, 45, 44% were monthly or quarterly. So we had 80% right there. And so, you know, look at the, um, the bank relationship, uh, the bank scorecards are much more prevalent. Um, then we see, uh, bank relationship fees, uh, and Dan, Dan will probably chuckle at this one. Um, 87% of people said they agree or strongly agree. They understand their bank fees. Good for you. Um, I hope that's really the case. This is where I was surprised that 88% uh, thinks they're bank thinks they understood that thinks they uh they have benchmarks and then Stefan I was really shocked well I guess I was shocked I was surprised it was this high so 19 percent said they don't really understand the Ray Rock model I thought that would be uh much higher and then just some more uh benchmarking relationships and so oh I finished at almost a minute early um Dan you're probably impressed so now it's my pleasure to hand the floor over uh, to my friend Dan. And Dan, before you dive in, why don't you give us just a little bit of a background about what you guys do at Redbridge? Yeah, sure. And I am impressed. Uh, that, that was world record speed there. Um, so, so Redbridge is first and foremost a debt and treasury advisory company. We're a global company that provides treasury uh, advice on a variety of topics, including bank relationship management, uh, debt, all sorts of topics around there. But one of the other things that makes us unique is that we're also a technology company. We offer software products to help uh, with sort of the long-term monitoring and management of things like bank account management, uh, bank fee management, card fee management, et cetera. So lots of different things that we do. Um, I work with the, the software side, uh, Stefan works with the advisory side, and so we, we thought we'd bring you a little bit of a, a flavor there in talking about bank fees. So the, my take on this, and I've looked at a couple of bank fee statements over the years, and my take on this comes down to the fact that the more knowledge you can have, uh, the more power that you have in this, and the more ability to get clarity into what's going on. The problem with it is, though, um, I loved those survey results, but what we tend to find when we're talking to a treasury organization is, is that they're either just overwhelmed by the sheer amount of data that I get on bank fee statements. And if they're American account analysis statements, that's one thing. If I move overseas and I'm starting to get global BSB file formats and dealing with currencies and taxes and all those things, 
the, the sheer volume of it can be overwhelming. And, and then let's face it, bank fee management is usually not topic number one in most treasury organizations. We have things we must do every day that if they don't happen, things fall apart. And so I think most treasury professionals feel that they need to be doing something with their bank fees. They're getting nagged about it. They're losing sleep over it. But we need to come up with easy ways to help them do that. So we have to deal with the overwhelming, overwhelming volume of data. Then we have to deal with the fact that no two banks do it the same. Lack of harmonization, I talk about that. We've got to harmonize this information if I'm ever going to do anything like benchmarking, right? Because that's a mandatory thing. Um, and then I need to just be able to, to, to hold on to it and get visibility into everything that's going on. Think about those bank fee statements that you get from your banks each month. It's usually the last thing that happens between you and your bank in the month. So there's all these transactions that have been happening throughout the month. And, and uh, when I get a summarized version of that bank fee statement, if you think about it, it's got every volume, every price, every charge, every balance, every rate for every account at every bank for every month. If I can get that into a well-structured database, the sky's the limit of what I can do with it. And so what I need to be able to do though, is I need certain abilities to handle all of this. I refer to them as superhero abilities, and that only really comes from the fact that I have seen a number of treasury professionals really advance their careers in their companies simply by being the person that figured out bank fees at their company. And that's what made them a superhero. I'll tell you what, if you save your company 10 or 20% of what you're spending on bank fees, you get promoted. And so this is a part of the way of looking at this. So I take these super abilities that I need and I break them into four different things. The first of those is accessibility. Right, so I need to be able to get all of this data every month uh, and, and, and get it into a well-structured format so that I can do all sorts of fancy things with it. Right, and that means in the US, I need to be getting these statements in uh, electronic EDI 822 formats. Globally, I need to be getting them from uh, the, the more global BSB type of format. And I need to get the data in and I need to then code the data so that I can do things like compare uh and aggregate right and to your point about afp codes absolutely essential currently there's there's two sets of afp codes in the world one of them is domestic in the us and the other is global there's also the ability then to translate them across boundaries but they're absolutely essential the problem is is that they give a lot of people headaches because generally in the industry we tend to ask exactly the wrong two people to map those service codes. We either ask somebody sitting inside the bank to figure out how to, how to map each of their services to one of these now 2,800 different AFP codes, and they're not very accurate. So the AFP codes on your statements are not very accurate. After that, we tend to ask the treasury person themselves, and most people in treasury have neither the experience nor the time to sit with a whole bunch of services and figure out the codes. And so one of the nice things is that AFP offers an accreditation services service for banks where an expert will actually sit down with all of the bank's services and hyper accurately map them to the exact right AFP code, which gives you the ability to have an apples to apples match at every bank in the world. And, and I stress that and I spent some time there only because that is very important because without it, I can't tell you how much an apple costs at this bank versus an apple at that bank, right? If I don't have apples coded the same way. I also can't ask and answer questions like, how much am I spending on apples globally or wire transfers or ACHs or check deposits or any of these, these product areas. So the AFP codes are very important and that's what then gives me visibility into my entire cash management engine. And so by looking at this in different ways, looking at volumes, prices, charges, I have a lot of different ways to see what's going on and get true visibility into my cash management engine. And that's an important thing to be doing every month. The other thing to your point on report cards is what I refer to as accountability. Now with our banking partners, in most cases, we have some form of negotiated pricing in place. 
right? We recommend that we, we get that pricing in place for as long as we can, three and five years in some cases, so that we can lock in the expected prices. But the problem is, is that the billing nature of, of the bank billing files can be very error prone. Not because the banks are bad or do it on purpose, it's just a very complex bill to gather together at the bank. And if I'm not watching it, we know, we see in a lot of surveys, between seven and 10% of all the services that are billed are billed in error. And if I'm not watching that, then I'm losing that money. And that's what I refer to as accountability. The, the rigorous audit every month of all of the different things that go on. Of course, then when I know what's going on today and I know where my business is heading, then all of a sudden I can do things like predictability and be able to forecast into the future. If I make this business change, how's that going to impact my bank fees? If this market change happens, how's that going to impact my bank fees? And so those are the abilities that you really have to have if you're going to do this. And so after that, I just I, I made a list of some of the different things that you should be examining on a monthly basis or frequently at least. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but there are a number of best practices that we've developed over, I think at my last count, I had, I had looked at a little over 11 million bank fee statements in the last 10 years. Um, and so we've come up with some decent practices to look at. Some of them are just relationship-based things. Uh, how should I let the banks bill me? What kind of statements or settlements should I get? Should I pay them every month for my fees? Should I pay them once a quarter? A lot of different options from there, especially when dealing with earnings credit. Um, how can I compare across my banks? Um, and then you mentioned, uh, and we definitely are seeing a trend of a reduction in the bank accounts. How should I rationalize all my bank accounts, right? Can I spot when I get billed for an account that's not mine? Not uncommon. Can I spot when I get billed for an account that I close six months? Even more un not uncommon. Uh, so, you know, can I find accounts that are not having any transactions, inactive accounts? All of these are things that I can look at just from seeing my bank fee statements. So a few other things that, that uh, are good to look at each month. Let's look at things about the services, right? All of a sudden I see a new line item appear on my statements. Well, if my statements are represented by a two foot tall stack of paper, the chances of finding a new service, almost impossible. If I have electronic eyeballs watching it, uh, then I can see it. Services I'm not using, uh, what I like to call punitive services. Uh, services where I consumed some charge from the bank, like, I don't know, a wire transfer repair or a notice of change for ACHs or something along those lines where they provided a legitimate service. Uh, but I would rather not have to be charged for those kind of things because it's my behavior that led to the, the service. So how can I find all of these things? How can I make sure that I have the right fraud services, right? Tell me about any bank account, for instance, that has, uh, that has, uh, disbursements on it, but does not have positive pay maintenance on it, right? It gives me a view into my controls. All of that can happen from my bank fee statements. So just some ideas to think about uh, here. And, and finally, um, just a couple of other things to think about from the balances point of view, right? In the US at least, mostly in the US, we receive all of our balance information on our account analysis statements, the average monthly balances, right? And that's a very useful piece of information to look at and understand how well I'm controlling my cash, looking at it with a month long lens. So make sure you know what your earnings credit rate is. Well, today in a zero rate environment or near zero rate, they're pretty low. Um, and that's an interesting point from a cash management point of view. When rates are low, we also need to be looking at other rates that are being we're being charged for. So for instance, what used to be called the FDIC fee, which can no longer be called the FDIC fee, but it is a charge for insuring your balances. If you're not watching that in comparison with your earnings credit rate, it's quite possible that you can end up in a negative rate situation where it actually costs you money to keep balances on hand. I need to be able to look at and understand all of those things. I need to understand how the bank is doing the math on all of their things, on these hundreds of statements that I'm receiving every month so that I can get the best possible outcomes. So I know what's happening, visibility, 
and I know that my banks are charging me properly accountability so that I can rate the whole relationship and have good performance indicators of my banks. That's technology. All right, thank you so much, Dan. Um, I have so many questions, but we'll save those for the end. Um, fascinating information on your bank account analysis statement. I know um, that Dan would be happy to have a conversation with you uh, after the webinar um, if you want to have more, learn more about that. Um, so now we'll go ahead and uh, dive into uh, Ray Rock um, with Stefan. So Stefan, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone again. So I'm very glad it's not, I mean, depending on the time zone, it's not after lunch because we can really fall asleep sometimes we're looking at these things. They can become too technical. I am guess I'm the only one awake and uh, all the time I talk about this, but uh, here you go with the RayRock. So RayRock stands for Risk Adjusted Return on Capital. People tend to know RayRock, uh, at least the notion, uh, but in fact, uh, we, we, it, it's very hard to understand how the banks use, use the RayRock, and if they do, uh, trust me, they do. It's embedded into their technology, it's in their decision process, it's how bank manage, just like insurance company, manage the risk, manage the return, manage their uh, uh, capital, which is a very restricted and limited resource. They have to allocate the capital, they have to maximize the return on the capital, and they use this type of uh, performance measurement, uh, such as RayRock. Um, with Bezel 2, Bezel 3, you know, we talk about economic capital, but uh, the best proxy to measure economic capital is going to be the risk-weighted assets, especially in this new environment uh, under Basel II and Basel III, where the regulators have done an incredible job uh, trending towards economic capital, which is the true uh, the true cost, the true consumption of risk into the bank's balance sheet. Uh, I'm already falling asleep. But uh, RayRock is very simple, right? It's uh, when you look at this slide, you're just like, okay, what do I need and, and how can I calculate it? It's a simple equation where you need to look at the revenues of every single transaction you are uh, managing with a bank. Um, and for every single transaction, we need to look at the what I call the cost to income ratio, the operating cost of those transactions. Cash management, bank fees, is not uh, inexpensive for banks to manage. It costs maybe between 60, 70, 80 percent of uh, cost income ratio. So the net profit is going to be 20 percent. So you pay a million dollar in bank fees, but they're only making 200, uh, only sorry for that, 200 thousand dollars in uh, EBIT. Let's call it this way. Um, and you have to do that for all the fees that you pay to banks if you have a if you want to have a good idea. Banks are going to do that. They have the system, they collect information, they know the share of the wallet, they they have this technology to be able to collect. I mean, the most advanced or most of the banks can do that. So they're going to be tracking all the revenues that they, they make with you, and they have their cost to income ratio for every single revenue. I suggest that you do the same to have a good understanding about the profitability of your banking relationship, which profitability doesn't mean the return on equity, and we come back to that. Um, so you see the first two steps here are going to be about collecting the revenues, uh, which is, that can be tricky when we talk about spot, uh, forward, uh, swaps. We don't know, or it's hard to know. Uh, cash management, uh, fees on capital issuances or M&A, easy. Uh, another thing to look at, I mean, who is taking care of your uh, the shareholders and distribution of uh, dividends? A bank is doing this somewhere. How much does it cost? Who knows this information? How much fee are we paying in M&A? Yeah, here and there. Sometimes this information is stuck at the highest level in the organization. You don't know. We're talking about millions, if not tens of millions of dollars here uh, that has to account for this. Another, another information that to, to collect is also wealth management. You guys have 401k, pensions, short-term, long-term investments, and those banks, they do wealth management, they have asset managers, they take asset management fee out of those uh, uh, funds, and that is part of the, the share of the wallet. So be very wise, and we have a slide to address that later, but revenue is tricky, but coming back to the scorecard, 
it's it's it, it it's a job that has to be done. Custom income ratio, it's even trickier. How how I mean how do you know what is the cost to income ratio to bank on bank fees, on MA, on capital issuances? So you can look at their uh, annual reports. They only 500 pages of plenty of information, but if you do read the annual report, you're gonna find a lot of information. Um, there are plenty of studies that can talk about this as well, or you can call people, Great Fox, like Redbridge or whomever, they can give you a, a couple of information. But having a good understanding about the cost of the service that you're consuming is key. On average, cost to income ratio in the banking industry is gonna be about 50, 55 to 60%. Um, of course, when their revenue go down, the cost to income ratio can be up because they don't, I mean, they do fire people, but they have a kind of a fixed cost all the time uh, that, that, can, that can make the cost to income ratio vary uh, when they uh, underperform in a given year. But usually let's keep in mind 55, 60, 65% cost to income ratio, uh, a global business. Another thing here that is very uh, difficult to understand is the cost of liquidity. So there are, a few costs that I don't like at all uh, in the US and in the world. Um, Dan mentioned FDIC fee and all those fees that the banks, they want to pass through. Um, almost all the balances in the world are insured. All of them. You go in France, you go in Germany, you go in the US. A retail industry are protected to a certain amount of balances in the bank accounts. But only in the US do I see FDIC fee because it's common to recharge a cost that you have to uh, give to your clients. And by the way, your balance, they bring something to banks even if we are in a zero rate environment because the net return on capital of your bank is more about two, 2.5%. Every single money that you leave here is making money for the banks. That's a transformation business. Banking industry is a transformation business. They make money out of balances. So why not to take this cost and not charge it back? It's another conversation. Uh, liquidity cost, the same way. Why should you uh, transfer the cost of liquidity when this is your job to lend money? Uh, if you want a good proxy here, nevertheless, because you want to calculate Rare Rock, I would recommend to look at your bank and look at the CDS of your bank and divide it by two. A bank, take the Borg Park, a bank has a very limited equity and then all the rest is money that don't belong to the banks and lending. They go and raise funds and they have to raise a significant amount of money to perform their, 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 their funding exercise in, 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 the, in the industry. Um, if you take the CDS of a bank divided by two, you're going to have a, a good indicator as far as what is the cost of liquidity. Uh, the cost of risk is very interesting. This is you. And we come back to this notion. This is the rating. This is how they see your risk. A bank is always looking at the time of default, always, because like an insurance, they lend money. They need to make sure that you're going to pay them back. But as soon as you have a relationship with a bank, they suspect that you're going to be in default in a given year. So they have to factor this in, in their model, and they have to cover this cost of risk of lending you money at any point of time. So this is a numerator. When you take the revenue minus the cost to income ratio, minus the cost of funding, when you do use their balance sheet, minus the cost of risk, hopefully you're still positive and you have a positive EBIT number or EBITDA number that you have to compare to the economic capital. Economic capital is a very tricky exercise. We go through the slides a little bit later. Uh, and this is the true notion of uh, how much the bank is, is, is putting aside of its capital for you to lend you money. And that's what they need to leverage. And that's what you need to be concerned about. And that's this slide we addressed a little bit just to tell you about the revenue and uh, what makes you attractive to your banks. You're all attractive to your banks. Uh, they do a pretty good job most of the time because this is what they do to, to, to get to the 12, 15, 20% of return on equity. This is what they're looking at. When we talk about Rayrock, they do that by combining all the revenues and managing how much money they give you according to risk criteria such as rating or other risk criteria that we're going to review. So this is just a list here of every single, how a bank's going to look at you from a product standpoint with all the, the, the products and 
all you're paying for all those fees, whether you're able to measure it or not. Uh, when you talk about scorecard, when you talk about share of the wallet, you need you need to look at all those fees, and uh, you also need to pay attention to are you capital intensive? What is your risk profile? Uh, did you size the liquidity the right way for your organization? Because banks are going to be sensitive to all those uh, criteria. And only we can move to the other slide to, to go through the, the risk criteria. So this is where you guys can fall asleep. Uh, but that becomes a little bit tricky, but I'm going to go through it. There are a few risk criteria that are super important. Uh, four of them. One is called the exposure at default. Remember, I told you that the bank is always going to look at you in a default situation. Not that they wish that, it's just their job to manage risk. Exposure at default is when I lend you a hundred million dollar, um, how much of this money, uh, of this uh, lending, are you going? am I going to lose? I'm the bank. So they have to measure at the time of default, what is their exposure at the default? Because when you have an RCF of $100 million that you don't use, they still consider that when you're going to be in need of this money because you're going to die, then you're going to draw the lines and you're going to draw as far as 60, 75 on average. So even if you think you're not using your line, the bank is going to look at you just as if you're consuming 75% of your RCF or 60%. Those are criteria that they can decide if they are into an advanced model under Basel III. If they are not advanced on only standard, the regulator is going to dictate this type of percentage. So keep in mind, you're not using your line. You have an RCF. You think it's OK. Why is it so expensive? Because from a risk perspective, they, the bank considered that the risk at, at stake here is 60 to 75% of the amount, even if you use nothing. LGD, lost given default. Okay, uh, I'm at the default time and I'm, draw, I'm drawing my line of credit, but am I going to lose everything? No, you're not going to lose everything. There is, uh, there is a recovery process on average the lost, uh, the, the recovery rate uh, for banks is more about 55%. So uh, even if you come at the time of default with a $100 million exposure, somehow on average, the banks are going to recover 45% of that. So they need to assess what are the, 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 the money and the amount that they are going to lose. LGD is, uh, as I mentioned, on average 45% in the industry meaning that the recovery rate is 55%. It can vary depending on uh, the collateral that you give. If you have, if you're totally unsecured or if you give some collaterals, they're gonna have an impact. The nature of the collateral as well, okay? If you're a REIT and uh, they take real estate as a collateral or if you give invoice as collateral, if you give cash as collateral, there can be plenty of different impact here. Uh, another uh, criteria, risk parameter, is the maturity. It's obvious. The longer, the more uh, risky it is, uh, and that, that matters. So I'm not going to spend more time here. Another one that is extremely uh, sensitive, I've been writing on this. I urge you to, be, to consider it. This is what we call the probability of default. Probability of default, this is linked to what we call your internal rating. Most of you, as an individual, know your, your credit score. I discovered this in the US five years ago. I need to have a great credit score, 720, 800, whatever. And it's great. You can have two or three agencies that are going to tell you what you're worth. And you know, uh, for a mortgage, for a lease, what you can do with this. Well, you don't know it for your organization. I'm amazed. In some countries out there in Europe, by low, if you ask what is my internal rating, the bank has to disclose it. The same city, the same B of A, Wells Fargo is less probably involved in Europe or in Asia, but at the end of the day, the same bank that you deal with here in the US, they will disclose how they see their counterpart in Europe. Here, if you're there asking, I think you have a no as an answer, I urge you to ask this question. What is my rating? How do you see me? and use their internal scale. If you can move on, Ernie, to the, to the next slide. I want to pause here because to me, this is extremely important. 
uh, even though immediately you're going to tell me what am I going to do with this information? Well, if you keep asking this information to all your banks, and if you're a single A and all the banks is giving you, they're giving you a hundred million dollar commitment, the margin should be the same more or less, or some people are going to make more money than others. That's it. So you need to have this benchmark of on how your bank sees you. Yes, all your banks are going to run a credit analysis on you. Do they contact you? Are they asking you any information about your leverage ratios, the financial ratio that they look like? Most of the time, a credit analyst is a young guy out of school. I started as a credit analyst. I've been rating Fortune 500 companies when I was young, and I was looking at their annual reports, et cetera, putting that through my models at the bank level. And I've had, I was even doing through going through what we call a qualitative analysis about management, strategy, et cetera, to give my clients a rating. And this rating is not always communicated, if never. It has a strong impact, as you can see in this slide on the bottom right here. This is according to uh, your risk profile, and this is only investment grade. Look at the shape, how high it goes when you're about to go crossover. Imagine when you become a double B plus, double B, double B minus, and so on and so forth. Uh, you're going crazy up. And those banks here, again, this comes from uh, Redbridge analysis, uh, extract from annual reports of banks. You can find that. It's just a little bit of time to dig. And uh, the other one that you see here is that on average, what are the number of grades the bank are using to assess their counterpart, you guys, the, 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 the corporations they deal with. Uh, so yes, they use grades. No, they don't communicate that often. Yes, you have to ask and insist because if it's not about, if banking relationship is about transparency, not communicating this, then I don't know what it is about. So this is a great topic to, to address. Do this and uh, we can move on, uh, Ernie, to the next slide to, to, to get into a little bit more detail. Why is this important actually? Because uh, the risk weighted asset that you see here Let's call it the economic capital. Let's call it the capital of a bank. The capital of a bank is extremely limited. It's not going to go up and down in a given year. This is, this is set in stone. And the question is how much of this capital can be used by clients, depending on those risk criteria, that can have a strong impact on the size of the capital you're going to consume. So the probability of default here, this is you. The banks are going through this internal rating analysis and they assess uh, the, the, the corporation performance, the corporation risk. If there is any guarantor in a loan or not, if there is a guarantor, then the guarantor is going to follow the same process in terms of risk assessment. And at the end of the day, we're going to have one rating that's going to equal one probability of default. Let me, let me rephrase that with my fresh accent, probability of default and expressed in basis points. Uh, so it can be uh, one, two, five basis points when you're single A or I have a grid here, triple A, A plus, double A, we're gonna be talking about two, three basis points. When you get into the triple B area, you're between 20 to 50 basis points. When you get into the double B area, it comes to one to 3%. You see the shape, it's going very high, that has a strong impact. And then the light blue here, this is a transaction that you use, nothing about you. If you use factoring, if you use uh, a term loan B, A, an RCF, those, the, the RWA, the risk weighted asset are gonna be different because every risk criteria varies. The exposure default will be different depending if you use or if you don't use the line. The LGD, the lost given default, is going to be different depending on the nature of the loan, if it's collateralized or not, that's going to have an impact. And of course, the maturity. All those criteria are only linked to the transaction, leasing, factoring, account receivable, securitization, uh, RCF, uh, term loan A, term loan B, whatever. So that is that has a strong impact uh, and that impacts pretty much the, the, the risk weighted assets. If we can go to the next slide. So why should you care? Um, because at the end of the day, so uh, we run 
a lot of analysis where uh, we take all those risk parameters into consideration. We assess them for every transaction, and the, the, the bubbles that you see there, they are business case. So they are corporations. We have analyzed their entire bank fees on a given year, and we put them into this graph. So if I take this uh, big bubble, the double B minus that was $361 million on the, on the right side and low side here, this is a company who pays in a given year, if we're talking about big size company here, $361 million in bank fees a year. That is huge. Do you know that on average, the Fortune 1000 or maybe 100, sorry for that, is going to be paying on average $100 million in bank fees, all combined M&A, capital issuance, uh, bank fees, uh, leasing, asset management, everything. Talking about big money here, in our study, mixing all size of corporations, on average, our clients, they pay $45 to $50 million in bank fees on average. When you look at all those bubbles here, uh, this, this is not the full extent of our, uh, of our analysis, but you're going to be not far from the $45 million in bank fees. So this one here, triple B minus, this is not too crazy as a risk, but it's very, very capital intensive. This uh, client here had a $10 billion uh, facility that they were using as their sole uh, source of funding, and it's super risky. In this $360 million, this, that was split out of my mind by probably 40 to 50 different banks. And there is one thing super important. When you look at the, never know how to say that, upsides, okay, the X bar at the bottom, you see 600 to $700 million in economic capital. There is a huge risk of concentration for banks. Banks, they don't want to go for a certain amount individually, a certain amount of capital exposed to you guys because they have an entire portfolio of man to manage. So the, the big money here is great, but normally you, it, you're, it's hardly profitable. The average rate work here was 14% and they're below, and they are super at risk because they are over consuming capital. Banks can say, I have a huge risk of concentration. I'm out of this relationship and there is nothing you can do. So why should you measure your risk asset, your risk quality asset and your revenue is because you want to understand what type of risk you can eventually meet out there. A risk of concentration, bank is leaving, a risk of not giving enough, you're below 15% of return. Uh, you also have the risk of giving too much. Look at those A plus company here, paying 181 million and giving 25% of return to the bank. This is way too much. The reason here is that they consume they consume very minimum RCF and they had a huge volume of business to give to their banks. So that's great to understand where you say where you sit into this graph and how much you're overpaying or identify all the risk that you are um, taking. We can move to the other slide, Ernie, uh, quickly because the time is flying. So. Uh, the role of railroad in the banking industry, it's critical. Uh, not only the bank, you know, I told you, uh, the equity is the only thing that is not, uh, that is set in stone. That's not going to change in a given year. This equity, this equity is like a big cake. And this cake, first, you need to allocate to some divisions, the retail, the investment banking, the corporate banking, wealth management. And you're going to do that according to the return you can receive. So sometimes banks are exiting an entire industry. Sometimes banks are exiting an entire geography uh, because they don't have enough return. I don't know if you're aware, HSBC decided to reallocate most of their business in Asia and Middle East, America being in a kind of a gray area because they don't get enough of, of business or return in Europe. And the equity they give to this region is underperforming. They're gonna give it away bye-bye the RCF, bye-bye the lending capabilities if you're not able to pay. And that's a reality that all banks uh, are facing today and they're looking at RayRock or economic capital to assess this. So normally they define the risk budget and they allocate the risk budget. On a transaction base, they make decision, a yes or no. They're never going to say yes or no just because you're giving enough return or not, but that's going to impact their final decisions. Performance, because everything has to be measured today. Uh, 
you know, uh, the cost of risk, uh, when you look at the cost of capital, sorry, of a bank, it's about nine to 10%, the cost of capital of a bank. If you're not able to generate return above nine to 10%, you're not crea creating any value for shareholders. So banks, trust me, they are measuring this all the time. And they use the RayRock to do that at the macro level and at the micro, at your individual level. So here, the role of RayRock is that once you know all this, my only advice here, and then I ask you to receive the deck, is that you need to understand and you need to ask. If you don't ask, you don't get. Don't be afraid when the bank is telling you we're not making enough money. Because me personally, I never know what it means. You're not making enough fees. The fees that I'm giving you are not profitable enough, or it's profitable, but the return on equity is not the same. Understand those three metrics. The fees are not enough. I'm giving you 5 million of fees a year. This is not enough. Yeah, but those fees are not profitable enough. Okay, and the small profit or the big profit is not, that doesn't provide enough return. Try to see those, the, those three different aspects. Sell your credit. You need to understand how they see you and you can invite your bank to explain to them your performance individually, never all together. Don't do that. But take them one by one and explain your financials to your bank if you want them to take the best of it. I'm going to pause here. I've been talking too much. Uh, Ernie, uh, I give it back to you. Uh, happy to answer any questions uh, now or later. Uh, thank you so much, Stefan. I mean, it's, it can get pretty dense, but it's absolutely critical. Uh, my treasury story, uh, my company, uh, was, you know, they, people really wanted to put us um, in a slot and we were getting charged too much. So my, my, my old boss, the treasurer, he was amazing. He was constantly communicating, arguing, right? Because he knew, right, the cost of capital uh, was going to go up. So he was very proactive in that. So I, I you know, some great information. Again, um, if you want to um, speak more um, with Stefan, please uh, let us know. I'm happy, happy to get you connected with her. So just some, uh, some key takeaways. I'm going to go ahead and I'll launch the final polling question here um, as I as we uh, wrap things up. So um, just some key takeaways. I like to put things in, in a bow and kind of tie them up for you guys. There are two sides to a bank relationship, right? And for me as a treasury practitioner, I wasn't good enough about being a customer, right? Being informed, being informed on both sides. And so be a good customer, right? Um, know what you know, work with your banks, understand your bank fees and understand your RayRock, right? All of that is a part of Honest communication, proactive communication, being a good customer, right? What just to think think of all the things that we've said today. What does that mean? That means you have a good relationship, right? That's ideal, right? I know what you're making, you know what I'm making. We align on expectations as necessary. And we measure, we monitor, and we communicate bank relationship success metrics, not only internally, but to our banks and ask them, how are we doing as a customer? I know it seems like kind of a Maybe a novel idea, right? To think in that way, but I think it's incredibly powerful. And again, a lot of information, but it's extremely important. And that's why uh, I was honored uh, to have um, my two co speakers again. So, first of all, uh, one by one, um, Dan, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I, I sincerely appreciate it. So, thank you, Dan. Thanks. Uh, Stefan, uh, thank you so much. I think I've been trying to wrangle you on a webinar for like three years, so I'm glad you you finally succumbed uh, to my request. So thank, thank you, you for that. Uh, and, and so also I want to thank um, the audience. I value each and every one of you. Those of you that have friends and family on the front line of COVID, I sincerely appreciate uh, what they do uh, every day. And uh, until next time, everyone, make the rest of your day great. Thank Bye, you, everyone. guys. Bye-bye.